Welcome everyone and thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, in this one of these last sessions of the Vienna Leeds, Leeds Summer Tax Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Leopoldo Parada, I'm a lecturer in tax law at the University of Leeds in the UK. And I'm hosting this series uh, together with my colleague uh, Leandro Ledeman, who is now going to introduce herself and our fantastic speaker of today. Thank you so much, Leopoldo. I'm Leandro Letterman, the William W. Oliver Professor of Tax Law at Indiana University Maurer School of Law in the United States. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Stephen Dean, who um, is on leave from Brooklyn Law School and is the Faculty Director of NYU Law's renowned graduate tax program, as well as the host of the podcast, The Tax Maven. In addition to his writing on tax law and policy, his scholarship focuses on the many ways the law tries to channel private resources towards public benefits, including the book, Social Enterprise Law, Trust, Public Benefits, and Capital Markets, published by Oxford University Press and co-authored with Dana Brackman Reiser. Professor Dean graduated from Yale Law School, practiced at Debevoise and Plimpton and at Cravath, Swain and Moore, and became Vice Dean and Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School. Today, he will present his fascinating paper titled, A Constitutional Moment in Cross-Border Taxation. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Professor Dean. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Leandra and Leopoldo. It's really a privilege to be part of this uh, incredible community you've created out of uh, unusual and difficult circumstances this summer. Um, uh, it's been amazing to connect with uh, many people that I've met before uh, and many more that I have never met before uh, in this entirely new format. Uh, and so kudos to both of you for uh, creating something good out of something pretty horrible. Uh, so we, uh, I know we all really appreciate that. So thank you and thank you for letting me be a uh, part of it. So uh, this project uh, is, uh, you know, as uh, the introduction uh, suggested, the first time I've written uh, uh, something long about international tax in a long time. And part of the reason for that is that starting with, uh, to me, with, with FATCA, um, I, I was really fascinated to watch uh, what was happening in the world. I really thought that uh, something new and interesting uh, could be uh, happening. Um, and I still, do, uh, I still do think that that is a, a real possibility. Uh, uh, although I'm getting more concerned that we're going to uh, let this constitutional moment uh, slip away, a time when something really uh, uh, important could happen, a uh, real change could occur. Uh, so far, uh, it's really just been uh, more of the same and uh, deeper entrenchment uh, of the same. So I'll get started, and I really am looking forward to uh, comments. So uh, although I think everybody says that they really are going to uh, keep their comments short, I really will try, uh, so we'll see if I uh, am able to, uh, to do that. So uh, the paper, A Constitutional Moment Across Border Taxation, uh, really is my attempt to grapple with uh, that uh, potential for change that I see uh, and trying to see, uh, explain uh, how that uh, change might occur. All right, so just take a step back from what we're doing now uh, and um, you know, imagine that you are living uh, a long time ago in 1845 and you want to send a letter from Philadelphia to Harlem. Um, oh wait, not that Harlem, uh, this one, more A's. Uh, so you want to send a letter, right? This is before Facebook and TikTok and everything else, but there, there was media before that. It was just uh, physical, right? Um, so uh, you would do this and uh, you know, this is what it would look like. Right, so uh, back in 1845, when you want to send a letter uh, from Philadelphia to Harlem, uh, it would um, uh, be a little complicated. And you'd have to first get it to New York from Philadelphia, then it would go to La Havre. And if you can parse out uh, up near the top, you'll see where uh, it refers to the trip to France, and then it goes uh, overland uh, to the Netherlands. So it's, it's really complicated. And, you know, I'm sorry to do this to all of you who have been uh, grappling with the rise of digital taxes, but I, I, I suspect for some of you this is kind of a trigger. Uh, you're picturing uh, the same thing happening uh, now that happened uh, a long time ago, uh, and it's kind of a mess. So just to break down, uh, well, just to make it look even more familiar to you, 
uh, this is what would have happened to that letter, right? And this is just because this is an actual letter that I, I got from the Smithsonian that went from Philadelphia to the Netherlands uh, in 1845. This is literally what it looked like. Um, so uh, what that would mean, you get five cents being paid uh, to get it to New York. Then there'd be 85 Dutch cents postage due when you received it, which is kind of awkward because you're paying to get a letter somebody sent you. You don't know whether you know, they're telling you good news or bad or something you want to hear or not. So none of this worked very well, and it was all very complicated. And I, I think that uh, what we're seeing now in uh, the digital tax space uh, is uh, really something uh, that evokes the same uh, sense of confusion uh, of, um, you know, every state just trying to make something work. And of course, it's, you know, very, uh, very strange that we would be uh, back in 1845 uh, with social media and everything else, but I, we, we kind of are. Um, so the, the question then is, how have we done this to ourselves, right? How have we gotten to a, a stage uh, in our tax base where um, we are uh, repeating a mistake that folks have made a long time ago? So what's interesting to me is to look at uh, how we overcame this the first time. So when you look at what uh, world historians say about the period where our international tax regime uh, took shape, um, and you'll note that I, I, I'm, I, I can be quite the pedant, uh, which you will not be surprised to learn since I'm a tax law professor. So I don't say international tax in the piece. I, I insist on cross-border uh, taxation for reasons that I won't go into here, but I, I do know that's a little weird and I apologize. Uh, but the way we got our international tax system uh, was, uh, was both unique and not unique. This is something that was happening in all sorts of areas uh, where we are grappling with um, the rise of the modern uh, cross-border communication. Um, you see this quote from this great book, if you haven't read it, you should, Transformation of the World. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, incredible for those of us who have uh, dealt for a long time with uh, cross-border tax issues to see this put in this kind of uh, perspective. Um, you know, international mail, right? The reason that we have stamps, and maybe you've not spent as much time thinking about stamps as I have, having stumbled across this uh, letter, um, that's where stamps come from, and that's how they work. Isn't it kind of incredible that you put a stamp that you buy at your post office in Philadelphia uh, on your letter and it just goes anywhere in the world, right? That's, that's pretty weird if you think about it too much, as many things are if you think about them too much. Uh, but this is all part of that same uh, uh, transformation that occurred uh, in this period um, where, uh, as he says, uh, much else besides was simplified and standardized for large area of the, areas of the world, uh, and tax was no exception. So. Shifting to tax, the you know many of you are familiar with Gratz's uh, uh, Gratz and O'Hara's paper, the original intent of international taxation, and he's making a very different point, uh, uh, sort of the um, uh, uh, just a very, a very specific point about uh, uh, a scholar that he admires uh, and he thinks doesn't get enough credit. Um, uh, but he talks about the original intent of inter U.S. international taxation, and what he points out is that. The original intent of U.S. international taxation was meant to be source taxation, right? This was meant to be source taxation uh, uh, before the end of World War I. Uh, uh, Adams came up with the foreign tax credit, which was uh, a very different way of organizing the world uh, than we currently have. Uh, so, uh, but of course, you know, he frames it as the original intent, which, you know, uh, U.S. folks are obsessed with uh, uh, constitutional law, which is, uh, you'll see reflected in the paper as well. Um, but what's he getting at with the original intent? Uh, that he's uh, uh, reaching for sort of the originalist claim that we uh, had it right and are now doing it wrong. And this is something that uh, U.S. scholars love to do and say. So the question is, what was uh, the mystery that he creates with his paper is, well, what, what came after that? What do, we, uh, what do we replace the original intent with? Um, and what we replace it with uh, is what um, you know, he, he and others call classification and assignment. So this is the world that you and I know. It is the uh, Esperanto of international taxation. It is the postage stamp of international taxation. It's designed to uh, keep the world uh, very simple and manageable, uh, right? Rather than uh, addressing each business transaction anew, uh, reach cross-border transaction anew and thinking about its uh, about its meaning and its significance and uh, where that income was earned in some uh, true economic sense. 
uh, we have these different uh, classifications, baskets, buckets, whatever you want to call them, uh, and there are just a certain number of these, uh, and every transaction that we uh, engage in across borders uh, just gets stuck in one of them, right? So it gets put in one of these baskets. Whether or not it fits well there is a different question, but that is how we do it. Uh, we put these uh, all the income one could earn uh, in these buckets, uh, and uh, that might be business income or royalties, and uh, that's just how we do it. So first we um, uh, classify, um, and uh, then we assign, right? So uh, cross-border uh, business income uh, is going to be assigned, uh, and this is where we get the uh, what the original intent was replaced by. Right, so um, you uh, instead of having a foreign tax credit, which allows the uh, the source jurisdiction to claim the tax, uh, we shifted to uh, a, a situation where, for active business income, uh, that's going to be uh, taxed uh, in the place where it originates, if you meet the appropriate thresholds. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, leaving out a lot of important detail here, uh, but this is how it works, right? So for uh, some kinds of income, it's uh, uh, put into one place. We might call that source. Um, uh, and for other kinds of income, uh, we're going to uh, put that in a different basket, uh, bucket classification, and we're going to assign it elsewhere, right? So uh, the kind of income that is going to be generated could be uh, uh, treated as um, uh, business income uh, or royalties, depending on uh, uh, our, our perspective on it. Uh, and that outcome is going to change where uh, the income is assigned. And that, of course, is a big deal. Uh, and you know, my project in the paper is not just trying to understand what it is that the original intent was replaced by, um, uh, but what it all means. Uh, and when it comes down to it, I, I try to think of whether uh, this system uh, of classification and assignment uh, succeeds. Right. So uh, you know, uh, it may not be what we started with originally, uh, but maybe it's better than our original intent. Uh, so that would be great. So the question I ask is uh, one way of looking at this, do we have too many categories or do we have too few? So one problem that we see a lot, and here I'm talking about Katerina Pastor's work, uh, uh, The Code of Capital. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very interesting book. If you haven't read it, you should. Uh, and she talks about tax a little bit, but she's mostly concerned with uh, other kinds of law. Uh, uh, but the, the phenomenon that she identifies is one all uh, tax folks will be familiar with, uh, what she calls coding, private lawyers, um, uh, essentially reclassifying uh, income uh, that might have been business income, reclassifying it as royalties uh, to get a better assignment. Right. So the problem with having too many uh, categories is that uh, it allows for this coding uh, that uh, uh, tax lawyers um, can uh, reclassify and therefore reassign income, preferably to nowhere, uh, or at worst, uh, a jurisdiction that doesn't do a very good job of taxing that uh, income. Uh, so that's one issue uh, if you have too many categories, right? If you only had one category, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, I, but uh, a different problem, uh, and this is something I talk about in the paper uh, and uh, uh, is, I think, a helpful way to understand why the system is the way it is, right? Why we have the system uh, that we may not think works very well. Um, so we may have too many categories, we may have too few, right? If we have too few, uh, I think this is where uh, we get to our, um, uh, our problem, right? We get back to uh, the problem of uh, the digital space, right? Uh, and this fight, uh, so that the idea of numerous clauses Many of the folks on this call, I'm sure, are very familiar with it, a civil law concept uh, that really um, is used in the U.S. Uh, in property law. It's where it's best known in the U.S. legal space. Uh, there are just a very few kind, not very few, there are only a certain number of kinds of property ownership that are permitted. You can have a covenant, you can have an easement, uh, you can have fee simple, uh, but you can't just make it up. Uh, and why that's true uh, is because we want to have the market work effectively, um, and uh, if you have a, a, a limited number uh, of categories of uh, property, or in our case, income, uh, that's going to uh, limit the um, uh, uh, information cost to market participants to understand uh, you know, who owns property if you're talking about property law, or uh, who can tax income uh, if you're engaging in a cross-border transaction. So it's very helpful on the information cost uh, uh, perspective 
uh, which is, I think, why it was so attractive to folks 100 years ago, um, uh, this real sense that they needed to uh, standardize and simplify, and uh, applying numerous clauses, rejecting poor uh, T.S. Adams' original intent uh, uh, callously and heartlessly uh, in favor of this uh, information cost reducing numerous clauses uh, concept. So uh, I, I want to uh, end there, and I'll stop screen sharing. Um, uh, my, uh, my goal in the paper is really to set all this up. Uh, and then the question that I think this um, really invites is, how do we replace that, right? So I think what we're seeing in the world now is uh, you know, a great pressure on this numerous clauses framework. And that's what you see with the, the uh, flourishing of digital taxes. Um, uh, and you see this new distance between uh, the US and Europe. Uh, they find themselves uh, quite surprised not to be on the same side of this issue. I think much of the world is uh, intrigued to find uh, the US fighting with Europe over international uh, tax. is something delightful and new for those of us who uh, uh, come from tiny little countries that um, uh, don't usually get to uh, uh, stand up to anybody. Um, so I think it's very interesting. But the question is, if that numerous clauses framework breaks down, uh, what can we do uh, to replace it? Uh, and I think that um, hopefully there'll be time in the, in the conversation to think about this. What kind of framework would allow us to uh, replace uh, the League of Nations numerous clauses framework? What would have the legitimacy? What would have the um, uh, technical sophistication necessary to uh, make that happen? Uh, and I think that's you know, a question that I'm grappling with, and I'm sure we're all grappling with, uh, uh, but I think uh, is very important. I think that we're uh, witnessing the potential uh, failure uh, of this 100-year-old uh, system. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I'm terribly sad to see it go, uh, but I do worry uh, about that envelope, right? Uh, the rise of digital taxes, uh, even, to, even to me, doesn't look optimal. Um, I'm not sure it's worse than uh, what we have, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's not optimal. Um, and, uh, you know, unless we take this seriously before uh, things go too far, uh, we might find ourselves in an even worse position, which I wouldn't have said was possible five years ago. All right, so I'm very excited to hear from, uh, from folks here. Um, and uh, thanks again to uh, Leopoldo and Leandra for uh, allowing me to join.